Big Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. In this episode, we got one of our returning Bigfoot all-stars with us, who is going to be once again talking about the subjects that are near and dear to the research that he's doing. He's recently at a conference here. He's going to talk about that a little bit and some interesting footage that he got out in the field. And uh, with that, we're bringing back and welcome to the show again, Rich Sewell. Hey, Rich. Duke, good times. Thanks for having me. Always fun to have you back, man. I know you're busy, and I'm busy, and I try and get you back on the show as often as I can to keep us updated on all the stuff that that you're doing and anybody else who isn't already aware of it. Get on over to Knox Gigas at the internet, N-O-X-G-I-G-A-S dot com, correct? The Knox Gigas study, yes. And that's my yep. repository, and uh, I, I update stuff all the time. And, and the current research that I have is uh, hoping to find some DNA link uh, to Zana, and we can talk a little bit about the Russian Zana story, too. All right. Well, you know, uh, let's get right into that then. You just dug up some real interesting stuff about the uh, not only the DNA study on Zana, but how it connects to another DNA study that's uh, been ongoing here and uh, really, you know, points in kind of a really strange direction here. So you want to get into that? Yeah. uh, There was recently uh, research done, and it was uh, done in – it was a ghost gene that was found in sub-Saharan Africa, and it was published in July of 2017 from Buffalo University and Dr. Gukuman. And they were doing – studying mucus uh, kind of membranes for different – uh, bio, uh, bio bacteria uh, ability to dissolve bacteria in that, and they stumbled across a muc 7 e gene that was wildly different, and it was so different it did not cluster with either Denisovian or Neanderthal, and it came out of Sub-Saharan Africa. It only club it only clustered with the Sub-Saharan African uh, population of uh, out of that area. And interesting enough, it, when you look at it, uh, it has some very uh, varied um, DNA details that I think would make it uh, a good case that we could link it to some study done in 2013 by Dr. Sykes and the research that he had done with Quit and the descendants of, they had six descendants of, of, of Zana of the Russian Alma. They used a tooth of quit, and then they had six descendants also uh, that they used for that DNA study in 2013, if people remember when Dr. Sykes did that. Well, what they had found out is that uh, this was, that Azana was 100% Sub-Saharan Africa. And the two, the two theories that he put out at that time is that she either was a slave that came into that region of uh, Georgia is where they had found her, or she was a um, 20 or 30,000 years ago an archaic hominid. So uh, when I was able to connect those two, I really had to look, uh, you know, it didn't readily come come to me when I uh, had that information. I had to do a little research, and I did some research on the plague. And if I'm explaining too much of it right now, just go ahead and interrupt. But I'll try to just make it real quick how I came into this information. Well, before you uh, go forward to the plague, let me cover something quick for audience members that may not be totally up to speed on the whole Zana thing. There's yeah. no existing remains of Zana. That's all gone. But there are existing relatives. And one of her direct descendants, one of her sons, Kvit, who is now also dead, they actually managed to dig up his remains. They got his skull. Uh, Dr. Igor Burtsev over in uh, Russia had it, and he's the one that provided the sample for Dr. Sykes for his study to take a look at the DNA and try and figure out what exactly is going on with this thing. Correct. So, yes, very good. And um, so that study in itself has just kind of sat on the shelf until this uh, recent uh, study that was done. Actually, in October, it was... uh, they had it released to the 
Molecular Biology and Evolution Journal of Oxford, and they, they, they have graphs and everything, and I have that listed. I sent some of those to you. But yeah. it makes a pretty fascinating case of this MUTE7E gene being uh, wildly different. And when you look at the fact that uh, Zana was um, – directly correlated her genetics to sub-Saharan Africa, and this is the only location there where this particular MUC70 gene exists, uh, when you connect the dots there, it's very interesting. So what my, uh, what I propose is that if they, if they still have any uh, from the original research of 2013, the study that they had done, if they have any of that DNA that they could test for this MUC70, that they do that, and if that is introduced in modern times, i.e., grandma was a Alma, then we would know that. We would see that in the genetics, and we would right. see that right away that that was a modern introduction. The actual study of this MUTE70 gene, they're saying it was introgression, which means it was introduced uh, – in uh, thousands of, you know, 20, 30,000 years ago in the sub-Saharan African DNA. And, and so if we have a modern introduction of that, then we really have a signature to look for for the Russian Alma. So I think that's pretty exciting. I actually sent that uh, very brief description that I had uh, linking that information to this recent uh, Oxford study to Dr. Sykes, and he, this week, I, I literally came up with this January 30th. I wrote the paper, and I had it on my website. And then I presented it last week at the uh, Nebraska Bigfoot Conference. And then this week I had uh, received a message back from Dr. Sykes that uh, he thought it was interesting uh, suggestion, and he thanked me. And so I'm hoping that they still have some uh, DNA available from that original study that they could link that because that would actually verify the work that Dr. Sykes had done and it would benefit, uh, you know, it would actually solidify his, his opinion on that theory that they were from sub-Saharan Africa and we have a, we have solid DNA evidence to prove that then. That's really so that's cool. exciting stuff. That could be, that could be a big deal for the Bigfoot community. And we know um, that uh, we had talked about this before we came on the air, but, about emergent hominids and how there were there's a lot of that going on all over and that it's the norm it was the norm of 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 those times to have all of this sort of neanderthals interbreeding with homo sapiens and uh so we had a variety of that going on yeah. when they would emerge and, we're only beginning to... and heidelberg yeah. and yeah. other ones we well, don't have names or know what they are and... we we have no idea a lot of it and um, but we do now have a subject that we can test and that we have uh, knowledge of and we have DNA evidence of, and we can trace this back to this MUC70 gene. So that's the huge difference because there there's a lot of other stuff going on out there that yeah there's discoveries every day, but we don't have living descendants with this right. DNA signature, and we do with the uh, with the Zana's descendants. And if and we now have a signature to look for with this mute seven E gene. So I think it's it's exciting to me. I uh, feel like this is going to be a huge discovery if it can be proven. And I don't think it would really be that difficult for them with the way they have the uh, they use the beast software. That the way that they are able to trace DNA now and and do those sorts of research. You know, three or four generations ago is not difficult for them at all. They can isolate that very easily. And if she's carrying, if she is the, you know, the one who has brought this MUTE7E gene into modern times, then she is a, a huge outlier. And now we have a, a blueprint for a signature for the ALMA. And we can use that for testing for other uh, hominids. Which I think is right on. Go ahead. This could legitimize the research that all of us are doing. Uh, so I think there's huge ramifications to this, and I'm very excited about it. I know it's difficult for people to understand. Uh, it's not an easy topic, and uh, unless you had your own DNA done, you don't even really understand how they can do all this. But they really can. They can tell you 
if your grandmother four generations ago was 100% Native American. They can tell you that. Even yeah. through recombination, uh, you may only have like 0.3% of Native American in your DNA now because only your, on your female side, the mitochondrial, half of it is uh, recombinated every every generation. Your mom only passes on half of her genes to her offspring. So fascinating stuff. Uh, there's a lot that I think we are living in the times of DNA research that is going to reshape the way we do our research in the Bigfoot community and certainly reshape the way we look at the history of mankind, or at least the hom hominids that exist. Our own existence, uh, I think, you know, this isn't anything going against the Bible, because to me, uh, I'm, I'm a very religious person. I have a deep faith in God, and I believe that really my um, uh, research that I've done only validates it even more, that homo sapiens are, uh, have, have um, their own place in this world, and we still are the ones, the keepers of this planet. So, uh, yeah, we're the weird ones. We're, <laughs> we're the special, we're the special uh, issue constructs. That's what we are. <laughs> we we have failed miserably at our responsibility. <laughs> we have failed uh, miserably. Well, but we're trying. At least some of us are. <laughs> some of us are. I recycle without question. Without question. So. Anyway, that you know, this is very fascinating stuff, and um, so I, uh, you know, I encourage people to look at this evidence themselves, and hopefully, I'm just crossing my fingers. I heard that Dr. Sykes may be retired, but he would have enough uh, uh, interest in this, and it, he seemed to have that when I when I when I sent that to him, that he would, you know put some of the pupils uh, there uh, and and get after it and get this study relooked at. And we could come up with a new case study on this, the whole Quit and Zana uh, legacy. And and we may have a hominid that exists in modern times, and we can prove it. Now, my question on this whole thing is they've got the, the MUC7 gene is still present in, excuse me, MUC7E gene, is still present in a sub-Saharan African population. Um, if it's from something other than a human, shouldn't it be that they could test them? Some uh, relic genetics from whatever the heck this was? Yeah, they have archaic. It's called uh, archaic introgression, which means just like uh, I have Neanderthal in my DNA, that was introgressed thousands of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that was introduced, uh, you know, many, many generations ago. So, yes, they, that's what they did find in this sub-Saharan Africa group. And because it was so different, it was so wildly different, it would not cluster. When they looked at clustering these, it would not cluster with Denisovian and Asian or Neanderthal and European. Neanderthal, European, Denisovian, Asian, they actually clustered together. But this was so wildly different, this MUC7E, that it only clustered with that sub-Saharan uh, African group and a percentage of people that do carry that. And so that, that is a huge outlier. So it is wildly different, they say. Interestingly, and, you, if you look at the, uh, just looking at the map, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa to where Zana was actually captured, um, there's really nothing to stop somebody from just walking from point A to point B. So it doesn't take like somebody being captured and shipped into slavery and, uh, you know, in Central Asia to get there is what I'm saying. Yeah. No, the but I, you know, when you truly look at it, and that's why I included a picture, some of these pictures. One of the pictures that I included was from a footprint that hopefully you can post this of that's that's in town in Macy, Nebraska. It's about an 18 to 20 inch footprint of a Bigfoot. Yeah, nice. Picture. And it has it has a what you call a splayed the big toe is splayed out, and which means the big toe is able to move out, splay out. And if you look at your own big toe, you cannot move your – you can't splay it out. That's just not a homo sapien characteristic. No, to do. no our helix is stuck in the forward position. We can't do anything yeah. about it. So here we have uh, a, uh, just – in June of this year, and, and we have, we know we have many people who have, Dr. Meldrum's done a ton of research on this, uh, of the, the whole splaying of the toes and the mid-tarsal break. 
So we have a very good understanding of the foot morph- morphology. But when you go back and look at Zana's story, and 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 they explain first per that this was from an article on my website, and it was from Igor Bortsev, and it was from In the Footsteps of the Russian Snowman by Dmitry Vayanov. And he actually interviewed people who were alive during Zana's time. They were very old when he interviewed them, but they remembered her, and they could give firsthand um, account of what she looked like. And when they go into that, if I could take a moment to read this, I think it's absolutely fascinating when you compare that to our modern uh, Patty. Yeah, please uh, do. I think uh, it would be handy for the audience that aren't up to speed again on this whole thing to know why this attracted so much attention and still is from Bigfoot researchers across the globe is a really, really interesting, weird, <laughs> completely out of the ordinary. But, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, you know, she was captured, actually, and one of the, the theories that I had about this, and that's why I had tied the, the kind of the plague to it, but I do believe the region that she was living in was right next to the epicenter of where the plague had had begun, and I do believe that there was some culling of the clan there over centuries that put her in a position of vulnerability. So she was captured by a group of villagers, and she was they used cudgels to beat her and tied her to a log. Um, this is clearly something that would not happen if the uh, clan did not break down. Uh, if there is an alpha male around, they protect their female. They are responsible for keeping an eye on the females and the, um, the the juveniles, and that just doesn't happen unless there's a complete yeah. breakdown. So I do yeah, believe... you would you would have ended up with a missing hunting party <laughs> and no oh, captured yeah. Zana if there had been a male around. There would be some headless people there, I would say. Yeah, they would be popping yeah. heads off. And so this is something that is a complete outlier too. The fact that she was even captured, I believe it was because uh, of circumstances. Now, I can't prove it, but I have kind of a cultural anthropology view of this, that knowing the Bigfoot clan, they would not abandon the, or, or let an orphan female. Now, we know through the Glide story, certainly a male might not, could be a threat, so they they did not take Glag in, but a female, by by most certainly, they would be taking, they, they another clan would have taken her in, and she had nobody. Nobody came to rescue her. She was tied to a log. She was uh, lived outside and dug her own hole next to this noble's house that she lived for like three years. They kept her uh, tied and tethered. And then finally, uh, when we get into the description of her, which I, I will, her, um, but she literally dug a, a hole to live in that. That's where she slept. This is not a homo sapien. Homo sapiens do no. not sleep in holes. She was not an abandoned slave. So listen, no. listen when I tell and, you. And we're not talking, talking about a warm climate here either. This is a cold area during the winter, and she wasn't doing anything different then. She was still sleeping in her hole in the ground in the winter, walking yeah. off in the river with ice on it. She was swimming in the Mokba River, and I'm going to read all this. So let me read it. Okay, go ahead. Here. So everybody gets an uh, idea of this, but uh, so um, she could endure, uh, she could not endure warm rooms uh, year round and in any weather slept outdoors in a hole that she made herself under this awning. And it, this was a nobleman. She was, uh, when she was captured, she was what we would basically call in modern times human traffic. She was just uh, moved around quite a few places before she came to this nobleman. But he did keep her, and um, he he had her for three years in this manner where he had her chained up and everything. And here's the description of her. Her skin was black or dark gray. Her whole body covered with reddish black. Wait, hair. wait, 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 wait. Go back. Her skin was black or dark gray? Yes. Humans don't have dark gray skin. Exactly. But we know Bigfoot does, does. And we know that from many observations. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just look at this. This was this this description is from something over a hundred years ago, 
that, that that these people are describing, and they have no other reference that we have right. today. And at the time so, he's getting there. a description from these people, these old local people in this village don't know anything about Bigfoot or that they might have gray skin. Yeah, they have no idea they're living in this region of Georgia near the Caucasus Mountains, so they are isolated. They have no reference to anything other than they have than Zana. Zana is their reference, and this is what mm-hmm. they are describing. And this is firsthand description from these people. This was done uh, years ago, but it's the best account that we have. This this was off this in Footsteps of the Russian Snowman by Dmitry Bayanov. And I got this off of the Bigfoot Encounters website, so I want to make sure to cite people can go. They can come to my website and read it, but I want to just give everybody credit here. So here's what, let me get into this. Her skin was black or, or dark gray, and her whole body covered with reddish black hair. The hair on her head was tussled and thick, hanging mane-like down her back. So she was covered with reddish black hair. She that's could not familiar. speak. That's interesting. She could not speak over uh, the decades that she lived with people. Zana did not learn a single word. She only made inarticulate sounds and mutterings and cries when irritated. But she reacted to her name, carried out uh, commands given by her master, and was scared when he shouted at her. And this is despite the fact that she was very tall, massive, and broad, with huge breasts buttocks, muscular arms and legs, and fingers that were longer and thicker than human fingers. She could splay her toes widely and move apart the big toe. The very picture I have sent you has the big toe moved apart. These are very characteristic features that are not homo sapien, but they seem to be describing uh, the alma, or the Bigfoot that we have here today when people are seeing. Um, so these descriptions, um, let me get that her, uh, she had a terrifying broad, her face was terrifying, broad with high cheekbones, flat nose, turned out nostrils, muzzle-like jaw, uh, wide mouth with large teeth, low forehead, and eyes of a reddish tinge. Type two. Huh? (laughs) Yeah. Type two. (laughs) This could be a this could be a an eyewitness report last week of somebody. Yeah. Yeah. No Uh, kidding. So, um, let me get back to it here. Um, The most frightening feature was her expression, which was purely animal, not human. Sometimes she would give a spontaneous laugh, burying those big white teeth of hers. The latter were so strong that she cracked walnuts easily. She lived for many years without change. No gray hair, no fa- no falling teeth, kept strong and fit as ever, as, as ever. Her athletic power was enormous. She would outrun a horse and swim across the wild Mokma River even when it rose in violent high tide. Seemingly without effort, she lifted one hand an 80 kilo sack of flour, which is 170 pounds, 167 pounds, and carried it uphill to the water mill with one hand. She climbed trees to get fruit. She would gorge herself with grapes. She pulled down the whole vine growing around the tree. She ate whatever was offered her, including hominy and meat, and with her bare hands with enormous gluttony. She loved wine and was allowed her fill, after which she would sleep for hours in a swoon-like state. She liked to lay. Here's another interesting one. She liked to lay in a cool pool side-by-side with buffaloes. Uh, At night, she used to roam the surrounding hills. She wheeled, so she was out around, running around at night, left in cool pools with buffalo, and she wielded big sticks against dogs and on other perilous occasions. She had a curious obsession for playing with stones and knocking one together and splitting them, uh, splitting them apart. So she probably would be uh, maybe getting minerals from that. She mm-hmm. took swims. Year-round she would swim and preferred to walk naked even in winter. 
tearing her clothes off, she was given in, into shreds. She showed more tolerance to, towards a loincloth. Sometimes she went into the house, but the women were afraid of her and uh, came near her only when she was in a gentle mood and not angry. Presented a scary sight, could even bite, but she obeyed her master, and he knew how to bring her to heel. Uh, so she, she helped with... Uh, Domestic tasks, grinding flour, bringing firewood, uh, taking Dragging off her the dead car <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Bring out your dead. Sonder, grab the dead cop. Bring out your dead. Oh, my so, God. So, and then, you know, the final thing is here, she did have children. She had, like, six children, I believe. And when the first, the first children that she did have, uh, she would always, she would give birth on her own. And she would try to um, give them a bath in the river, and they would always die. They would they wouldn't be able to handle that uh, cold yeah. water. They children couldn't do it. So the villagers began taking uh, her children away from her as soon as she had them, and that's how she, they raised Quit and other ones of her children. And that's how we have that DNA today. But I just wanted to to point out this is not a African slave. This is a description of a hominid that is close to Bigfoot and the Alma that anybody could describe given over a hundred year difference and having no reference to this. Absolutely no it, reference to what we're studying. It's absolutely amazing to me. Yeah, it sounds exactly like somebody's describing a Bigfoot for sure. And before we get too far off the subject here and everybody's still thinking about Zana taking a little newly born baby and trying to wash it off in the river. In the icy cold river in the mountains of the Caucasus, uh, yeah, you can see how from a human standpoint that's not a good idea and it would kill your baby and why is she doing that. Let's actually look at an example of humans who did that sort of thing and I don't know if you're aware of this or not, Rich, but that was cultural for the Eskimos. They really? Would take, no, I didn't. They would take their newly born infants and they would put them out on the ice and just leave them sit there for a little while and see if they died. And if they died, then they were dead. And if they didn't die, oh, then they'd survive as an Eskimo, and they'd bring them back in the igloo, and they were good to go. Very interesting. So that is almost the, the litmus test to see whether you're going to be strong enough to survive in their world. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm so just kind of wondering if it's along the same lines. It's like, you know, this environment is so harsh, and this is just the way we always do it. And if the baby can't survive being, you know, cleaned off in the cold water, then it's not tough enough to make it anyway. Exactly. That's that's nature versus nurture for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, just a bizarre fabulous. side note there. Not that it's connected or anything, but there is a parallel in in human cultures, and the Eskimos used to actually do that sort of thing. So so here we have Zana, and we've got this now modern mute seven E gene that we could test her descendants. She has grandchildren, great grandchildren, still alive today. And they had taken back in 2013. They tested like six of her uh, of her descendants, so they could they could go back and look for this mute 70 gene and see if this is archaic hominid, wildly different gene uh, is introduced in modern times. And now we have a match. We don't have her bones. They do say that she supposedly was buried in the same cemetery as Quit. They were able to, they do have quit. Uh, they did get his uh, skull, and they do have that, and they used one of his teeth for the, the site study in 2013. But there's a chance that with modern technology, because that was what, I don't know, when they did that, probably 80s is when they originally yeah, did Yeah, our, got our tech skull. sucked when they did that, yeah. So we've got technology today that could go in there and do ground penetrating radar. And I'm not saying we're giving up on finding Zana. If we have this mute 7 gene and can verify that, that she has, uh, she's the introduction of that in modern times, let's go try to find her with some latest technology. Yeah. They said that they, uh, the, people, the people that had known where she was buried, or at least had an idea, are all gone now. But right. they did say that she was buried in that same cemetery. They only had well, a shovel and pick to try to figure this out. Right, <laughs> right. Maybe. Well, no, even putting all that aside, assuming they never can find a grave, they never can find her remains, Kuvit and the other kids had descendants. They should have that same weird MUC7 EG then. They should have that. 
Yeah, and it would be introduced in modern times. It would be grandma was a Bigfoot. Right. So they should be able to just do a genealogy study on all the descendants and then the, the other local population go, who's got it, who doesn't? And yep. go, bingo, bango, that's where it came from. Exactly, and that would say a modern introduction. With all of these features, these descriptions, we have a modern introduction. We now have a signature, of a DNA signature, MUC7E, that science that we can use now to look for. When we go uh, collect, if if you if if you, and I'm, you know, I I do believe if they're able to trace it back there, that we probably have uh, just like we did. Um, all of the Homo sapiens, they came and went all over the world where there's no reason why uh, that the Alma and the Yaran and the Bigfoot in our country um, might carry some of this, just like we all carry Homo sapien genetics, uh, they might carry this MUC7E gene. Right. And that could be our marker. That could be our signature. And we could, as now we have a baseline for science and we have credibility. And the okay, world so all you that. researchers out there that are listening to this now, take note. If you get a, an apple with a big bite taken out of it and there's some drool on it, grab a drool sample. We can do something with it. we got something to match Absolutely. it to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this should be shaping. Uh, this this sort of discovery should be shaping how we conduct research. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. This is this is what we need. This is exactly what we need to validate with every, what's every, what everybody has been doing over the years. Now we can coalesce behind this. I truly believe everybody should be uh, together on this. Uh, we shouldn't have people arguing about this. Let's all come together and get yeah. this tested and look and get the final answer on this because this could be this could be the thing that we've all been waiting for. I'm saying it has a high uh, validity that it is. Just from the evidence I just shared with you. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely uh, fascinating information. As Meldrum might say, it's very compelling, and uh, <laughs> definitely uh, definitely warrants further uh, look into what's going on there because that's uh, that's some really good stuff. You know, and the other this thing is, is here that. Go ahead. Yeah, this is the this is the only example that we have now where we have all these pieces to the puzzle. And we have the DNA technology to do it. And so all these other outliers that are potential uh, uh, hominids that could could be outliers that people are discovering, we don't have the modern connection to that. This right. we do. This is huge. This is this is something that could truly shape the way we do research in the future, and and give validity where the scientific community because right now. Uh, and that was one of my fears that this Dr. Gukeman, who did the MUC7 e gene, you know, he's doing this. This was an outlier for him. It wasn't what he set out to find. And right. he's not going to want to put his reputation on the line to try to prove that this is a modern Bigfoot or an, or an Alma. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, well, so some of these guys have come up with uh, good stuff uh, based on Bigfoot that are in the science community don't, you know, aren't looking at Bigfoot and don't even believe in it. They're just coming up, coming up with other evidence than we in the Bigfoot community are looking at going, oh, wait a minute, this matches in with something that we know. <laughs> and we're the ones that are putting the pieces together because they're not paying any attention to it. We have to. We have to. If I didn't uh, step up with this and put this out there, this could have just been uh, thrown away, you know, the baby thrown out with the wash. The bath so, water. Uh, yeah. The bath water. So. Uh, we literally have to, we're the ones that have to make this connection, and that's what I want to implore to people today, get behind this study. Try to, let, right. I mean, I had Dr. Seitz at least respond to me, and he thought it was interesting. So I'm hoping that this is followed through and that they have uh, the ability to, to do this. But I think in the Bigfoot community, we need to kind of make sure this is, is followed through with and that we get some answers on this. It's huge. Actually, it puts us, uh, yeah, this is huge because it puts us w one really big step closer to uh, to solving the whole thing. And let me explain what I'm talking about here. We've got a DNA study, Ketchum study, you may not agree with it. We've got other people that have gotten samples and have had the samples tested and they've come back as unknown hominid. Okay. So that's not good enough for science. You need an actual type specimen that can be provable. In other words, 
somebody, you know, two or three people saw Bigfoot cut its finger and drop blood there, and we went over and took pictures and picked up the blood, and then we had it tested, and we can verify it came from a Bigfoot, and it came back as unknown hominid, and now we can match this sequence to the other unknown hominid sequences, and it checks out to be a Bigfoot. Okay, what's the chance that's ever going to happen? Pretty friggin' slim. On the other hand, we've got this MUC7E gene that is not present in humans, <clears throat> except this tiny population over in the Caucasus. And if you get drool off an apple over here and it's got MUC7E on it, baby, that's the grill right there. That's our signature. That's exactly what you exactly said what I was saying. That is our signature. And that is what can validate our research and move us forward in the scientific community. The scientific community can then get behind this. We could have scientists in the field now working with us on this. This is huge. This is absolutely huge. And science, scientists have two things that we don't, budget and equipment. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to give them, we know exactly what we're looking for now, and they know what to look for. We're all on the same page. Okay, you want apples with Bigfoot uh, mucus membranes on it? We will supply you with that in abundance. Okay? And that's the key. We, we're going to come together on this. I truly believe that. So, you know, you can send me the million-dollar check for finding Bigfoot. <laughs> I'm sure the check will be in the mail mere moments after this air is rich, not to worry. Thank you. I'll be waiting. <laughs> so it's exciting. I know obviously I'm very excited. I literally this is just this this month of February has been phenomenal for me and uh this has just all come together for me this month to, to put all this together, to have Dr. Sykes even acknowledge that, you know, that was a uh an interesting suggestion. Uh, so I think, you know, this this could be huge for all of us, and the Bigfoot community should get behind it. Uh, we, we have so many people that are trying to um, separate us, and we've got our own problems within the community that where we, we have infighting. But mm -hmm. let's get behind something together, all of us. We want to prove this. Let's prove it. Here's the, yeah. Here's our evidence. This is DNA evidence from Oxford. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good. It's definitely a good thing to have. So, what did you? What's your? Uh, what's your thoughts on the tie into the whole plague thing? I mean, uh, according to, and um, it, it traces back to the siege at Constantinople, and when the uh, defenders were giving up and leaving, took off of their ships, they brought the plague rats with them, back over to Venice and spread from there. Um, but obviously, this is right, you know, near the area where they caught Zana anyway. So, yeah, the, the local the, outbreak, it would have been all over that area where she was before it even got into Europe. So, what I'm saying is that whole the plague would have affected that area. Yeah, it was, you know, I don't know what the population density was like at that point, but I'm assuming that probably would have had the, the same uh, communicability and travelability that it did in Europe. And, uh, you know, even. Taking it, taking away that there were three branches of it in Europe, and maybe there was just the uh, general bubonic plague over there, still would have been enough to uh, to really cause havoc in the local population for a long time, and would have of course been communicable to the local Almas uh, <laughs> around the area. And so I kind of wonder if uh, if they sort of went through the same thing over there, where you know maybe they didn't have any kind of real. Uh, communication or connection to their human neighbors, but after that was going on, it was even less so, and it knocked down their population, too. Yeah, I totally believe, if you look, I have a map that I sent you, so you can post that, and that that has it, like, near the Volga River by the Caspian Sea is where the, the epicenter of the plague, and mm -hmm. that would have been, uh, you know, from the 14th century to the 19th century, waves of the plague. And that was carried uh, largely by uh, uh, even lice, and um, you know there was they, it would have been um, fleas and lice, which definitely mm -hmm. would be passed on to the alma uh, mm -hmm. uh, if they came if they had fleas and they were coming back to their home clan uh, every summer, there would be a decimation of their clan, 
Every summer would bring waves of the plague during these centuries. So I definitely believe uh, they were, since they were so close to that epicenter, they that 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 Zana was affected by those waves of the and and not only wiped up her wiped out her clan, but most likely wiped out all the clans in that area because nobody was no there was no other clan to absorb her. And we know today, people that really study the big populations are out there with them. We know the alpha male always protects the females. That is something that is just a part of uh, the inherent to these groups. And they are not going to allow uh, her to be taken uh, without, and even if even if she was captured, which she would not have been, they would have tracked down and brought her home. Yeah. You know, and lone females are way too valuable to leave wandering around alone. They'll take, you know, a, a troop will take in, from what I understand, pretty much any lone female. Cat gave an example of that when they had wild women yeah. in the clan for a while, and she was just a complete nut job, and the clan couldn't stand her. But it was like, uh, well, yeah, the female, we got to take care of her. And apparently they made some sort of a deal with a neighboring troop to take her after a while so they could get rid of her. But, you know, same thing again. They wouldn't let her be out on her own. She had to yeah, have somebody else to, to watch her. Absolutely. That is like cultural anthropology. This is a study of these Bigfoot clans. They would not allow a female to be taken. It's just not going to happen. So something created that. And when you look at how close these uh, Caucasus Mountains range, it's literally right on top of the epicenter of, uh, between the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea where the plague. And that would have been just for four centuries, literally, of the plague had to have taken a toll every summer. I have no doubt that fleas and lice spread uh, disease throughout the, the Almas in that population. That put her at risk. That's why she's captured. That's why she was uh, left abandoned, essentially human trafficking, terrible human trafficking story. Um, uh, that's why she was then uh, had offspring and why we have the evidence today. It was a series of events tragic events for her that give us this evidence, this DNA mute 70 gene today, I believe will validate that. Uh, I believe that is the, the missing piece of this and uh, it, it just would not have happened without uh, these series of tragic events and we know how disruptive the plague was. It was disruptive for the entire population of Europe, just as smallpox was disrupt, disruptive for all the Native Americans here in uh, America. Uh, these type of contagions are lethal, and they're cyclical. They're psych they come, uh, and yeah. they wipe huge populations out. So, I, you know, to me, it's a viable. People can argue it. That's fine. But I think I give a pretty good explanation of how this uh, had occurred. And to me, with this, uh, the, the, the big value that we take out of this is that we do now have DNA evidence that we can test for uh, modern introduction. We have a, a, a haplogroup and gene of the MUC7E that we now can isolate and have a signature for future um, research all over. And we should be getting behind this. We should be excited as a community. This is brand new. I know it's going to take people time to digest this mentally, but this this DNA is the future, and this is where yeah. um, this is changing. You know, we used to uh, do, you know, digging in the dirt and finding fossils. Well, now they're digging in DNA, and they're finding things that we didn't know. And this is just a whole different level of technology. Yeah. So I, I'm just really excited, and I hope the Bigfoot community is excited about this. And I hope Dr. Sykes uh, is able to do this, um, reintroduce the study and go back and look at that. I would hope they still have samples from doing that in 2013. It's not too terribly long ago that they, uh, but if they need to, they can go back to um, Georgia and test these descendants because they're still alive there. We know they're there. So yeah. it's all doable. Everything is doable. It's a lot easier than trying to capture a Bigfoot, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, right? Although we could probably get some spit off an apple without too much trouble. We might be able to manage that one. We're, you I know, think we're going to have all kinds of apples after this. <laughs> <laughs> Not that apples are the be all or end all. Get spit off whatever you can. I don't care. Give them a whistle. Whatever you can do yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> 
You know, the other thing that uh, that strikes me here is that, again, it's like we're putting all the pieces together. Where's the science community on this? Where was the science community on Dr. Sykes as far as that goes? I saw the three TV show thing that they did on uh, the DNA study, and he was getting samples from all over the world, and the Xana samples, one of them. And, you know, it was all like, uh, you know, it's a piece of lint off the floor. It's a horse hair or something like that. And he gets the one sample that the, the uh, they found inside of the, the tree over in the Himalayas and they bring and it comes back and he tests it and it's not uh, it's not a yeti but it's a bear. Yeah. Well, okay, that's, that's pretty cool. But here's the cool yeah. part. This is a bear that's a polar bear. There are no polar bears in the Himalayas. It's not just a polar bear, it's a variety of polar bear that's been extinct for like twenty thousand years. And apparently there's a live one wandering around in the Himalayas. Okay, science, get off your dick and go get a sample. <laughs> the biggest friggin' story in 100 years. You're sitting on your dead ass doing nothing. This is why I ridicule you. This is why I consider you pieces of crap. You don't do anything. Get your ass in the field and do some follow-up. End of rant. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I can tell you, uh, I talked to Dr. Meldrum about this, and Dr. Meldrum had had hair samples that he had given to that particular study, uh, and there were, I don't know if it was six or seven, very, um, he was explaining them that they were all very um, much the same and that these sort of samples, and he, he was upset he never got them back and ne- nothing ever happened with them. Uh, if they tested them, they were either thrown out as far as the research gotten from them. But here's the thing. We can't. We can no longer cry over spilled milk. We have now evidence that we've got to push shove right down their throat, and they've got to mm-hmm. do something about this. We have. Well, what I'm saying is that I have, I have high high dubiousness about the whole results of this uh, supposed polar bear sample. My oh, point being that was, if it really was, was a polar bear sample, why the hell hasn't there been any expedition to go find one? It was exactly. obviously a live critter when they collected the hair from it. It was inside of a hollow tree, dude. wasn't buried in a cave somewhere. Still had DNA. There's still live ones there. If that's what it really was, why aren't they looking into it? Yeah, I'm I'm 100% with you. I was frustrated that they were trying to call it the Yeti, that the that 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 the polar bear was actually. Uh, you know, the Yeti is the polar yeah. bear. I see there's, to that. just to digress for a second, there's a book by somebody else out there, and name will not be mentioned because I don't know or care, that's again claiming that uh, the whole Yeti thing is all based on misidentifications of Himalayan bears and yada, yada, yada. And I was over in the Himalayas for 60 years looking around, and, and this is what I found. Well, I'm sorry that you failed so miserably to find the Yeti. Give me, uh, you know, 20 days and a crew, and I'll do it. Because apparently you don't know what the hell you're doing. You may be good at finding bears, but you're not good at finding hominids, and that doesn't prove anything. So once again, more BS trying to debunk it. Yeah, and here here's where I can tie in our uh, Bob Gimlet because they spent 25 days on horseback to get mm-hmm. that uh, video. 25 days, 20 miles a day at least on horseback. Yeah. In an area where they know there were Bigfoot around, because there have been recent tracks and sightings there. So and they it still walked, took 25 days on horseback. Yeah, they would have not smelled like human beings anymore. Uh, they wouldn't be carrying any of the smells of the city no. uh, or anything like that. So they, and being on a horse, they would have uh, definitely been hidden from uh, probably just a curiosity. Like, what well, and horses sound what like is quadrupeds it? too. Without yeah. seeing them and just smelling the scent or anything, they'd be like, "Well, you know, it's a bit." It if like they just hear it, they hear an elk coming up the river. If they smell it, well, here's a horse, horse coming up the river. So what? Oh, damn! Yeah. There's a human on it. Time to get out yeah. of here. <laughs> yeah, I think that's literally what happened. I really do. It was that much of a surprise because we uh, we have, carry when we're out in the woods, we are so easily identifiable. But if you spend 25 days in the woods, you're a whole different assimilation in that. Oh, I know. You're taking yeah. on different smells altogether. So, I, uh, you know, that's just kudos to the hard work that Bob Gimlin had put in and, and the researchers all over who have done a tremendous amount of work. Scientists need to step up now. We are giving them 
the pieces of the puzzle. We're handing it to them. We're telling them exactly what we need to have done. Just do it. Yeah. Don't make us step forward and do your whole job for you and then have tons of eggs to throw at your face because we'll throw them. We'll throw them for a long time. <laughs> so it's, you know, I, I'm excited. I'm uh, I'm thinking this is a new era for us as researchers, and we're going to be validated from all the things that we've done over time, and we're going to have a new uh, direction, how we should be gathering evidence. And, um, you know, this to me is huge for the Bigfoot community. Absolutely. I think, I think it's, uh, you know, it gives us a great direction to go in. It gives us solid research that we can work with. It gives us something that's testable and pretty easily testable, actually. Um, so all we need is for, you know, <clears throat> uh, Joe Academy to push himself away from the donuts, coffee, and his desk for a second and get out there and do some damn work. Yeah, let's let's validate this MUC70 gene, and then let us go gather the – we'll go gather bushels of apples for you and whatever <laughs> else you want. We'll be sending you Bigfoot spit from all over the, from North America. <laughs> go check out. Yeah, I'll get some samples from Australia too. Exactly. <laughs> the evidence, the evidence is abundant uh, out there. Uh, we just don't have anybody that's willing to validate this for us. So now we do. Mm-hmm. And you know, maybe that Todd Disatel, he does a lot of the. I think Dr. Meldrum likes the work that he's done. At least that's what he told me. So maybe he, need, maybe we need to get him involved. I, I sent it to. Uh, the person that I thought could carry and get it done right away, and that was Dr. Sykes. And mm-hmm. uh, But maybe we need to get uh, Disatel. Maybe he needs to step up. You know, you people listening out there, contact these people. Let them know. Yeah. Well, and we don't need pressure. somebody that's a big name. In fact, it would be better if we had somebody that wasn't a big name that was just, you know, connected to willing some to reputable DNA lab that wanted to look into it. Somebody willing to do it. We just want them to do it. It needs to be done get it done. Uh, if they have to go get samples in Georgia, we know the family members are still there, so we can go do that. It's going to take yep. a little money, but it's going to, like I said, that's easier done than trying to catch a Bigfoot. So we got to yeah. find it. <laughs> yeah, that trying to catch a Bigfoot thing doesn't work out very well most of the time. I only know two examples of that. One, one is the Zana thing, and the other one is uh, – Weird report from the 1780s from uh, actually up north of northern Minnesota, north of Lake of the Woods, where they had an entire logging crew. The owner of the logging uh, the logging company that was out there setting up this crew and a, a basically a logging operation. They were building the buildings and the whole damn thing. You know, they had a giant crew out there. They had Indian guides out there that were taking care of the area for them and we're rounding up all the nasty local wildlife and getting rid of it and supplying them with food there because of course they didn't have any cattle or anything so the Indians had to hunt to, to get food for all the loggers and the Indians came back one day and said hey boss we got a monster up here uh, not too far away from us what do you want us to do and he's like what so they gave him a few scant details on it and he said well go go chase it down see if you can find it see if you guys can catch it and apparently, like a week or so later, they came back and said, hey, we, we figured out where this thing is. We got it more or less boxed in if you want us to go after it. And so he got all those guys and, like, 20 more guys, and they all went up there with their rifles and went after this thing. And apparently, after quite the struggle, they managed to put a couple of bullets in its leg and knock it down, beat the hell out of it, tie it up, put it on a palanquin, and haul it back. And then the story goes that they shipped it uh, down the river system, down the Mississippi, to go to some rich guy that was going to display it somewhere, and that's the end of it. You never hear anything else from it again. But interestingly, the description of this critter matches exactly with the description of a gugly. So that's wow. creepy as hell because it does not sound like a Bigfoot at all, but the description exactly matches with that of a gugly. So <clears throat> these sort of weird things have apparently happened more than once, and there's just, you know, so long ago, and you don't know. There was another one that supposedly they captured the Bigfoot in North America here and, and shipped it over to Paris for display, and that's the end of that mm-hmm. story. You never hear what happened to it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. we're lucky that we have one where there's actually something that we can trace on it, where it's like, okay, it it died here. She died here. She actually made it with some humans. They had the sentence. There's something here that we can actually look at. Exactly. We have every piece to this puzzle and all we need to do is to verify it through some dna tests that can 
basically go back and test who, where your your grandmother or great grandmother, and we know that they can do that easy enough. So this is all doable, and this would give us the answer that we need. It would validate uh, the research being done, and now we'll have a DNA signature as we collect evidence to move forward. So this is huge. It has. We need to get this done. This this is so rare. It's so rare to have all these things come together that that this has to happen. We have to make sure that that, that those descendants' uh, DNA is tested for this MUC70 and that we get the answers that we need for this. So I'm excited. <laughs> and noticeably so, but very understandable <laughs> given the circumstances. I would be too. Uh, yeah. that's, that's some really cool stuff. I mean, it's so... So much of this information that we gather is all, you know, like compilations of eyewitness accounts and peripheral information that we're gathering from areas that we know for sure they're around and all that kind of stuff. And actually have something that's like testable is really nice because it doesn't come along very often. You know, that's one of the things I know you like about the research that you do, Rich, and that's a lot um, tree and stick structures. It's yeah. actual, physical, you can look at it, you can test it, you know, like, okay, here's a tree snap. Does this actually point somewhere? Is this a marker? You can test that. That's really cool. But a lot of the Bigfoot stuff is just so, it's just no way to, to, to vet um, your guesswork. It's really hard to keep moving forward in a lot of cases. And by the way, speaking of tree and stick structures, you're sort of like the go-to guy on that whole deal. And you have a book, maybe two books out now. You want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, I have. Uh, from when I first started doing research, uh, I, from 2011 to 2015, I went from in the Mississippi River area to the Missouri River and then up into the mountain regions of New Mexico, uh, Montana, and Colorado, and here in Nebraska. And I wrote a book at that time uh, – corroborating all of the forest signs of Sasquatch called uh, the forest signs of Sasquatch, Nas Gigas on lulu.com. You can buy it on there. And that, that really just was corroborating this, that they were building these stick structures. The, the, I coined the term superstructures for the really big ones, the whole tree. And uh, they were building these in the, in the river uh, areas and these tributaries the same way as they're building them up in the mountains. They're just using either deciduous trees and then pine or hardwood uh, deciduous trees or then in the pine uh, forests of the of the mountain ranges, they're using more pine trees. So uh, that's the only difference. They're building the same types of structures. Uh, and I thought that uh, was really a good indicator. And to, to this date, if you camp near these areas, because I just, you know, when I go on the Omaha Res, that's what we do, you're going to have activity. You're in their home. So uh, it is a great way to study them and to be involved and to know that they're in your area and to know that there's active, you keep an eye on what's going on with these structures, that there's there's activity going on and what times of the year and all that, what they're building, but the X's, the arches, all the stuff that's out there. Uh, if you want to, you know, um, to have a book to use as a field guide, certainly buy, you know, go look at my book and, and buy it. I'd appreciate it. That'd be great. But uh, there's a lot, I got a lot of free information too on my on my website. So I'm not all about making money, but it would wouldn't hurt if we want to try to raise some money to to go to. It might be Duke and I going to the Caucasus Mountains to sort all this out. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'm actually in, uh, plugging him on purpose here because he's been on the show a couple times already and never even brought his book up, you know. So like, hey, go buy his book. It's really cool, guys. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot yeah. of competition out there. You don't have a whole lot of choices on Bigfoot tree structure books, and Rich is yeah. a spectacular photographer and does get into the areas that are tough to get to where you get some of these amazing, amazing structures photographed. And uh, if you didn't see it, we already did a show on that. He included a lot of pictures that he took in different areas, and we look at how they're all the same in all these different geographically widely separated areas, and uh, you know, geographically different too. You know, you got river basins that are down near the uh, <laughs> sea level, and then you got the same structures on top of a mountain 2,000 miles away at uh, you know 9,000 feet. So it's like uh, there's something weird going on there, folks. And these these areas, like Rich is saying. 
um, you start finding actual structures, start looking around. And usually you'll find tracks, too. And, you know, you can almost guarantee that there's there's a presence in that area. It may be intermittent, but, you know, Bigfoot built those things, uh, so they're around there. Yeah, yeah, they're communicating that way. And I will have another book out probably in the next few months. I've been working on putting it all together. I'm pretty, I'm about 90% done, but I want to include all this latest research, and I've got most of it in there now that I've, I've put I've written the article and put it out on my website about uh, Zana and her DNA. But right. I, and I, this will, uh, this will be the more um, uh, affordable. Everybody should have it on their shelf in their Bigfoot Library book. And yeah, I know the first yeah. one you turned out is like grand and glorious and needs to be on your crystal coffee table because yeah. it's <laughs> that kind of a book and and price wise uh yeah but uh <clears throat> spectacular worth having it should be on amazon the next one i come out with so okay uh so it'll be it'll definitely be more affordable and i did you know when i did the first one i took some great pictures that's what i wanted people to see i wanted them to see it but unfortunately that made it very costly uh so that was <laughs> That was the downside, but yeah. uh, my next book definitely will be more affordable, and you know, and I, you know, do I certainly would love people to buy my book, but also on my website I have a lot of information, so I freely that's my repository. And the biggest thing I want to get out of today's show is people get behind this mute seven e. Uh, talk to the, you know, maybe we need to get this to tell. I don't know who else out there that would be able to help us, uh, but let's let's get the word out and try to get this. Um, this discovery sorted out, get these pieces of the puzzle finally uh, solidified that we have genetic evidence now and we can all be, uh, we can go to Thanksgiving and sit at the table with pride that we are studying something. We have scientific knowledge that Oxford has acknowledged that. So <laughs> good times. <laughs> yeah, good times, exactly. Well, anything that moves it forward, you know, that's that's what I'm in favor of. Let's make progress. Let's get it figured out. Let's not sit here and spin our wheels forever. Um, that's what exactly, me. exactly. And that's that. I hope that is not the case. I hope this gets enough uh, energy to uh, really. I mean, it's such a rare thing to have all these things come together. Uh, but you know, the DNA is is there today uh, for us. So like I said, it, it's very similar to how we're, you know, we used to dig in the dirt. Now they're they're really mining DNA, and so this is a huge, uh, this is a huge like the gold mine for us here for researchers. And that meet 70 gene could validate and really move a lot of our research and in, into the positive uh, scientific uh, dollars, the dollars that go with all those real science. Uh, 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 projects that are going on, we could benefit a great deal. Myself, most of everybody out there, including you, do. We've done this on our own dime, and it would be nice to have some help in the future. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, <laughs> actually, some help that has money—that would be—that'd <laughs> be really useful. There's only so much you could do with a tin can and a you know disposable camera. And uh, <laughs> probably pretty much what we've been working with. We haven't had any. When was the last time there was a big money expedition that wasn't like funded by a movie company or something? I think the yeah, last one was happened. Tom it just Slick. Just happened. So, so hopefully, you know, if there's some people that uh, have, you know, it was funny because when I did my own DNA, they tell you who a famous person is that you're related to, and you know, I live here in Nebraska, and so it was ironic that the famous person that I'm related to in my haplo group that goes all the way back to Scandinavia and farther back is Warren Buffett. So <laughs> I, I, need, I need to contact Uncle Warren. If you're listening, please send money. <laughs> Warren, it, it will help the world. You will be glad you did it. You're so philanthropic. Please help us. Uh, really, definitely. Warren, definitely. we need your help, Warren. Warren, we need your help. <laughs> Uh, come on, Warren Buffet, you can do it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, actually, I haven't had the – both my brothers have had the DNA study, so I, I know from what their result was pretty much exactly what mine is going to be. And uh, But interestingly, we did have the genealogy study done. My parents did that and traced our ancestry back on both sides quite a ways, and I got one 
famous ancestor on uh, my dad's side, I, I think it is uh, Grace O'Malley. I don't know if you ever heard of her. Uh-huh. But, uh, she's historically very famous because there were very few women captains of pirate ships. And she was not only a captain of a pirate ship, she had a pirate ship fleet. Oh, wait, it gets better. She didn't have just a pirate ship fleet. She had her own port city that she was basically learning over. So we can only imagine how um, <clears throat> intractable and dangerous this woman probably was <laughs> to be in a position like that. But, yeah, that's the only uh, the only uh, relative that I have back in, in the past that I know of that I, that's uh, – "Quote unquote famous uh-huh. <laughs> pirate captain." <laughs> Getting back to the whole Bigfoot thing here, and and digressing the pirates all aside here, um, you also sent some really cool footage along here, some night vision footage. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I could talk about that, and I I know people want to they really enjoy hearing stories uh, about uh, field work and things that we've done uh, with research. And I sent this video that is FLIR uh, footage that I took in January of 2017 along the Missouri River on the Omaha Res. And it's very interesting. There's an anomalous uh, light uh, that is flashes about 36 seconds into it. And one of the guys that were there at the time went home with a bad headache. And if you know anybody that's ever gotten zapped, that is one of the things that tends to happen is uh, one of the things that happens is they have a really bad headache. At the time, I didn't see this uh, light myself and didn't think anything of it. But uh, over a period of time and looking at it, and once I did pull it up on my computer, I I thought, this is very strange. Um, But what it looks like is – and the the bigger thing is the people that I'm filming – is Dr. Meldrum uh, was there with the official Bigfoot search team, who uh, is Gary Volker, who is the brother-in-law of uh, the Ricketts family, who had uh, the Ameritrade. So they actually brought in Meldrum for this uh, little expedition that we did. So some pretty famous people, or at least some pretty big names, uh, um, in this little video. Are these guys that are in the, the center of the frame where you're, like, filming? Yeah, there's, there's there's in the, Dr. Dr. Meldrum is probably the tallest figure in there, and then Gary, I think, is next to him. And then Barry uh, Webster from the Res Watching is there, and then Elvie, who has been on some expeditions with us too, is there also from the Res. But what's We've had pictures of both of those Bigfoot guys before, but I'd like to bring this yeah. up again now because you did this before, and once again, you're looking at the back of them with a thermal camera. I mean, this is not – it's really hard to verify this is an actual Meldrum sighting. I mean, you, you know, last time it was the same thing. Yeah. You couldn't be sure it was Meldrum. It was kind of blobby looking. Um, you uh, know, it wasn't really well defined or anything. There's definitely a possibility it was a Meldrum, but I mean, you know, again, it's it's hard to know. It's suggestive, certainly. There's some healthy skepticism there, I see. <laughs> but, but, uh, that's part of big brain. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't couldn't help myself. So anyway, you got you got so, these guys so, watching. They're clearly watching something that's going on over in the woods. Have they heard a noise or something over there. What's all their attention on? Well, we are in a uh, essentially where there is a ridge line that they are looking at. That these this tree, these riparian forest goes up into this high ridge line, and there's all these uh, trees there. And what had happened was when we first got there. Barry had – we'd all got out of our vehicles, but it took us a time with our equipment, and there's actually a film crew that is there with us. The uh, the film – the uh, I'm, be, we're be, I'm being filmed in 4K, actually, and I know it wasn't that – it wasn't the, the film camera because he, he doesn't take pictures with that. He's just filming in 4K. He's not taking pictures, right. so that's not the flash. But there is a producer from, like, their amazing race, and then this – cameraman's from the Netherlands. So this is a pretty big production. They were there to film uh, for this uh, official Bigfoot search team, and they brought Dr. Meldrum in uh, when it was the weather was terrible. It was like probably two or three degrees. It was terrible weather, and they had to fly him in on Joe Ricketts' uh, airplane, I believe, this private jet, to come to this uh, that, that time. So it was kind of a big deal. I was very excited. Uh, but really what happens then 
I start panning to the right as as they're they're looking they're looking up into this ridge line to see if they can see anything, and uh, I think Barry had addressed them in the Omaha language, if I, my memory serves me right. But I start panning off to the right, and as I pan, you can see an outline of like a white uh, outline signature of like a head, probably peeking. And then there's another one even farther to the right as I keep panning over, but then this light flash, as soon as you kind of see that head, you see a light flash about 36 seconds. And I'm just wondering if the two of them there, I know Kat had talked about portals and that sort of thing, two of them can open portals or something like that. But I'm just wondering if the two of them there didn't do some sort of uh, sound and light. I think they're, the sound that they project, their vibrations like that, could play into this zapping phenomena. And so something, some anomalous light happened. So I'll let the people look at it themselves and make their own decisions. I just, it's very strange to see this flash of light. And then shortly after that, uh, you know, we've got this Brad that's on our team that comes out with us all the time on the res. He decides he needs to go home with a headache because uh, he isn't feeling very well. And I, if you look at me shortly after that, the, I kind of lose my focus and just kind of, I don't remember ever seeing any light, or nor do I believe I got zapped, but I do kind of move my camera away at that time right after that. So, so something could have uh, interfered or just made me do that. But anyway, it's an interesting, interesting uh, little footage there, and there's some celebrities within that. But that flash of light may be our first time ever captured a uh, type of Bigfoot bioelectric light flash or something. I have seen things when I was in the field, like flashes of light before uh, around me. And so that's why this really kind of struck me as interesting. And so see, see what people think. We can play it uh, with this on this video if you can attach it to the... Uh, Absolutely. Holder. And I, yeah. I think it's definitely interesting. And see if they see the two heads off to the far right that are kind of peeking around and uh, and that you know, it's light funny flash. you didn't tell me anything about the video you just sent it to me and I watched it and that was the first thing I caught I didn't notice Did the you? flash but I saw the head over on the right side going well what's making that glow over there that shouldn't yeah. be there is that a is that an owl sitting in a tree or what the hell because that it looks it's like the size of a basketball it looks or bigger yeah. Exactly, that's it. And then there's one, when I keep panning over, I'm kind of panning and going down, you can see another one a little bit farther down from that even. So when you look at it again, look at both of those. There's two kind of like basketball-sized white spots that seem to be peaking Bigfoot, I believe. And then this, <laughs> as soon as that one, uh, as soon as my camera kind of peers over to the first one, that's when that light flashes. So it's about 36 seconds in, you'll see the light flash very much an anomalies. I know it wasn't the cameraman. There's a cameraman looking at me, but I know he was shooting video, not taking pictures. So Yeah, you very can actually strange. see him on the video get into position over on the left side. Yep, yep. He comes in and he starts filming me. And it's kind of weird because, you know, I'm out there doing my thing with the clear camera and, or, you know, trying to take my own uh, little video of all this. And then to have somebody videotape you while you're video. I found I was in kind of a strange situation. And, and what's even really better is while they were paying attention to you, you were getting video of what might be actual Bigfoot phenomenon. And I think that's probably, that probably is what triggered it. When they saw the camera looking back at me, they knew it wasn't on them. So maybe they mm -hmm. felt like they could peek around. I don't know. It was very strange. But those the circumstances, you, you can watch it and see. But there's, a, there's an anomalous flash of light that I cannot explain. And then we had a member go home with a headache. So uh, whatever you Pretty take of that, so. I just thought, I thought it was interesting. People like to hear these kind of stories. And so there you go. I gave you a, two scoops today for some interesting uh, things to share with everybody. Right on. Well, you, you always deliver, man. That's why I keep having you back all the time because it's always a, just a, a riot to have you on the show. You're, uh, you have such a down to earth, um, you know, nuts and bolts science approach to everything, but you still have an open mind enough to actually look at the weird phenomena and go, 
okay, what the hell is going on here? This is really strange. How do you explain this this weird thing that's happening? And, you know, when you start seeing the same weird thing happening over and over again, it gets even weirder because then it's like, okay, this is, this is a repeating pattern. There's definitely something going on here now. But, uh, uh, you know, again, like the last time we talked about this and didn't do it, need to have you on again sometime soon just to do a show about your encounters. Because you've had so many, like, really creepy close encounters with Bigfoot that you could pretty much do a show just on those. And I'm, yeah, I'm encouraging yeah, you to come back I, and do that. And, you know, I'm, he- I'm hesitant to talk about those, and that's probably why we haven't done one yet, because it's just I don't like to talk about that very often. But I will. We can do that. That's, that's something we can do. Um, but those are just the kind of unpleasant things. Uh well, I know it's tough, man. I, I'm right there with you. I, I had, you know, I had three class A's, and two of them were not pleasant. Um, and I don't. Most people will, you know, recognize that Duke's one of those guys that doesn't bring up his encounter and compare everybody else's encounter to his encounter all the time. No, because my encounters sucked. I don't want to yeah. think about them. They were horrible. Uh, those were yeah. nightmares, living nightmares. The third one was the, the third one where Bigfoot just glared at me was the fun one. Okay. <laughs> well, and and what happens what happened with me is it was an ongoing nightmare because I mm-hmm. didn't think I could get out of it and I put myself in a situation that I'd made some uh mistakes, uh some rookie mistakes. And, well, and these uh, are, you know, Rich, those are the most important stories because those are the ones that are cautionary tales that the other rookies out there need to hear and go, "Oh, I did that and I was lucky enough to survive it." Here's what I did, and here's what you should never, ever do. And those yeah. stories are really some of the most important ones to relate to people. Yeah, I I, I definitely agree, and uh, I will def- I will come back. You have my word. I will do that. All right, man. Okay, as long as I, as long as I got your word on it, because I'm not going to let you break any more earth-shaking Bigfoot news until you come back and do a show on the cars. <laughs> You got it. Even if you got one in a cage and you've got it in your garage, we're not talking about it until you do an encounter show. Okay? <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> All right, brother. Well, thanks again for coming back on the show again, and uh, always always a pleasure to have you here. And looking forward to having you back on again soon. Thanks for sharing the uh, the earth earth shattering, uh, potentially spectacular, great news here that we have something we can actually go investigate and. You know, just like the uh, Claudia Ackley suing the state of California story. You heard it here first. Bigfoot and Full Wars on World Bigfoot Radio. I'd like to uh, to thank Rich for that and uh, and any any and all of my past and future guests for bringing all this stuff to me right away and uh, sharing it on World Bigfoot Radio. I love it. The listeners love it. And uh, it's it's really a needful thing. That's what I'm here for. I'm trying to move the ball forward. We're trying to get it down the field. We're trying to make some progress. And uh, Rich is a big player on that field right now, doing uh, his best to get down there, kick ass, and make a touchdown for us. So let's support him, buy his books, get on over to Knox Gigas. And meanwhile, everybody, take care, be nice to each other, pay it forward, always be safe first, last, and always, always be safe. And whatever you do, God help you, please do not hug the Wookiee. Bye, everybody.